Hi, um, we're looking at book eight. Uh, it's the book eight overview, which is in your booklets. Um, and um, as usual, we're going to have a little look at, firstly at the key events, hopefully fairly familiar. Um, firstly, the Tiber uh, and then Evander welcome Aeneas to Arcadia, the future site of Rome. Remember, the Tiber is the river that runs through Rome. Um, and although Rome doesn't exist when Aeneas appears, Evander and the Arcadians are living on what will be the future site of Rome. Evander tells a story to Aeneas about um, how they're just in the middle of um, worshipping Hercules. It's a festival, um, and Hercules is worshipped because he saved the Arcadians from this tyrant, Cacus. Now, this is quite a long rambling story, but the reason for this is because it's parallel to the present tyranny of Mezentius, who is the local uh, rival who is oppressing the Arcadians. In an attempt to bring Mazentius to justice and stop him persecuting them anymore, um, Evander offers his son Pallas to assist Aeneas. Now, important point alert, Pallas is Evander's only son. Evander is too old to have any more sons, and therefore Pallas is especially precious to Evander. And Aeneas has agreed that he's going to look after Pallas. Oh dear, we shall see what comes up in Book 10. Meanwhile, Venus, who's a little bit worried about Aeneas and his safety, trots off to uh, see Vulcan and, and commissions from him a suit of armour, which including the famous shield, which comes towards the end of book um, eight. And you can see a kind of shield in all the corners of the page that might have been something like Aeneas' shield. So there's your key events, if you just want to get those down. With regard to the Roman context, um, obviously the shield is fairly obvious, but there are a couple of other things that we want to pick out. Remember that there's lots of Roman history on the shield, but the main thing about it is the Augustan Roman history, and that is Actium, as we should look at in a minute. Actium makes up the majority of the cover of the shield. There's also a parallel because Cacus, who is defeated, is similar to Antony, who is defeated. And Augustus never refers to uh, Antony by name after his defeat, um, and, uh, and, uh, but he is clearly the, the kind of baddie figure. Aeneas also arrives in Palentium, and that is very similar to Augustus arriving in Palentium after the victory at the Battle of Actium. So we've got this parallel of the two of them coming in to Rome in um, Aeneas for his first visit, Augustus returning in triumph. In addition... The Latins are misled by the evil of Mezentius and the furor of Turnus. So what Virgil's really saying is that civil war is an aberration that is triggered by wrong-thinking people. So there's nothing wrong per se with the Latins, because obviously if there was something wrong with them, they shouldn't be being allied to the Trojans and becoming the ancestors of uh, the current Romans. So what we're actually saying here is Mezentius is so bad he's misled them and Turnus is so whipped up into his furore that he sweeps them along with him. Once Mezentius and Turnus are out of the way, the Latins can then ally with the Trojans. So there's a little bit of Roman context to go with that. The main focus then is the um, the Book 8 overview, Shield of Aeneas. Um, and that's what we're going to look at when we're looking at Virgil's style and his narrative techniques. This is the key example of ekphrasis in the Aeneid. So ekphrasis comes from the Greek, it means speak out, ek is the out and the phrasis is speak, um, and it's when a piece of art actually expresses something through its descriptive power. So if you can capture the entire story of something through a bit of art, then that is a piece of ekphrasis. So a picture of just an individual person may not necessarily be ekphrasis, but if it's got the whole story of that person's um, actions, then it is. And the shield of Aeneas is thus an artistic portrayal of the key events of Roman history. It goes right from the founding of Rome. It's got the rape of the Sabine women right at the start when the Romans didn't have enough women in their uh, city and they needed to find women from local tribes running all the way down to Actium. In the description, there's loads of stuff about uh, which refers to colour and sound and storytelling on the shield. Um, and in addition, three-fifths of it is specifically about Actium. 
So you get the first sort of it kicks off uh, line six twenty eight or so um, with Romulus and Remus and the Sabine women. So you get about thirty forty lines there. Then we kick on to the Battle of Actium at line six seventy, and that drones on all the way up to the end to really emphasise the victory. Bear in mind, if you're interested in Ekphrasis, there's another one in Book One. Um, you may remember when Aeneas arrives um, at Carthage. Uh, before he's revealed from the mist, he goes into Carthage and sees the bronze doors of the Temple of Juno, um, where the story of the fall of Troy is being recorded um, by the Carthaginians. So he already feels kind of welcomed because that he knows that they are interested in his story. Uh, and there's a nice ekphrasis there if you want to have a look at that. Line 6, 455 to 497 tells the story of many of the events of the Trojan War. And bear in mind, of course, that's a Homeric reference to the Shield of Achilles, uh, in, which is in the Iliad um, in Book 18, that, the whole of the, the shield. And then finally, character developments. Mezentius, a tyrant and a despot. So have a look at how he's portrayed um, in uh, Book um, 8 and uh, line 481 to, uh, to 493. He's not the nicest of chaps. Um, and... Um, Virgil says, I shall not speak of the foul murders and other barbaric crimes committed by this tyrant. Having said that, he then goes on to talk about his foulest crime, which is he even devised a form of torture whereby living men were roped to dead bodies, tying them hand to hand and face to face to die a lingering death, oozing with putrefying flesh in this cruel embrace. Ah, the kiss of death. Uh, surely it has never been so aptly and perfectly described. Having said that, don't forget, Virgil did say he wasn't going to speak of foul murders. But that's giving us a sense of what Mazentius is actually like. This really um, horrible description shows Mazentius is horrible. Um, Evander, who's the Etruscan king, um, says, I am too old for command and no longer have the strength for battle. So we know then that Evander can't take part in the war himself. That's why he's going to have to send Pallas. And Pallas is the only son, as I mentioned already. Um, and um, uh, what Evander actually says is, um, if my son's going to die, please make sure that I die before him. I don't want to see his death. Um, and this is what he, he prays to the gods because um, he doesn't want to actually um, suffer um, the death of his own dear son, my only source of joy given to me so late in life. So Pallas is obviously very precious to Evander. And then finally... How does Aeneas get treated by Venus? So if you have a little look at line 370, 372, uh, in line 370, Venus was terrified that something's going to happen to him. And then line 610, she trots off the ultimate Christmas gift, which is, um, please, can you make him this fantastic um, set of armour? Um, and, um, and so she says, here are the gifts I promised you, perfected by my husband's skill, um, and this is what's going to actually protect Aeneas. So that's your book eight. And hopefully that's all um, nice and clear and you can uh, you can be clear on what you want to have in those different boxes.